All right, it's time for my monthly wrap-up video where I rank all of the movies I watched over the past month. This time it was May 2024 from my least favorite to my favorite, my first time watches. Welcome to the Cobwebs channel. My name is Daniel and this is going to be almost all horror movies. So if you are a horror fan, you're definitely in the right place. But I do have a few outliers too because you can't just live on horror alone. And if you're a regular viewer of this channel, you know that I pretty much always do these videos physical media focused. I talk about the Blu-rays, the 4Ks that I watched over the past month because I'm a collector. I love physical media, but I'm actually introducing in this video that I'm going to talk about my streaming watches and my theatrical watches as well. The reason for that is I just need to cut back a bit on my collecting. I'll be honest, my family and I are fine, but inflation, you know what I'm saying? And uh, sometimes it's just more economically feasible to watch some movies on streaming and then just buy some movies. So that's really the main reason, but there are some cool movies in that category to talk about, as long as they are at least somewhat relevant to the channel. Like, I did take my son to see the Garfield movie in theaters. He's one years old. It was his first time seeing a movie in the theater, and he did a great job. He just sat on my lap and watched the movie. I was a really proud dad. But the Garfield movie, I mean, come on, who cares. I'm not going to be ranking that as part of this video. The movie was fine. But let's go ahead and jump in with number 20 because we got 20 movies to talk about. And this is Fright Night 2 New Blood. Now, if you're curious what this is, because it doesn't look like the Fright Night 2 that came out in 1989 that everybody knows, this is actually the sequel to the remake. So this came out in 2013, and I'm a huge fan of the original Fright Night. In fact, I consider it my favorite movie. So this has long been the only Fright Night movie I haven't seen. The weird thing about the movie is even though it claims to be a sequel to the remake, it's actually really another remake. And what it is, is it resets Charlie Brewster and Amy and Evil Ed played by different actors, up against Jerry Dandridge, but this time Jerry Dandridge is a woman, a female vampire. And it's a direct-to-video film, and it's not good. It's definitely not a good movie. Now, the versions that we have of, like, Charlie and Amy, they're totally fine. In fact, they might actually be closer to the original Charlie and Amy than the ones we actually got in the remake, but the version of Peter Vincent we get here is horrible. Peter Vincent, the vampire hunter, played by Roddy McDowell in the original, this time, I mean, he just seems like a washed-up football coach. He's just so generic. Uh, the woman who plays Jerry Dandridge is fine, but this is just like a really sleazy, low-budget vampire movie that just rehashes the plot of Fright Night for the third time, but this time it's the least interesting it's ever been. So I didn't particularly like Friday Night 2 New Blood, but hey, now I have it on Blu-ray. At number 19, we got a movie that I checked out in this Vinegar Syndrome box set uh, called Erotic Nightmare, and this is from 1999. Yeah, this is a box that Vinegar Syndrome put out called Made in Hong Kong, and it's three Hong Kong horror films. Fantastic packaging. You got a booklet in there, this hard box, then you've got a slip-covered case right here. Pretty incredible, but Erotic Nightmare specific, I watched two of the movies in this box set, by the way, so we're talking about two of them today. Erotic Nightmare is about this generic guy who has a job, and he's got a wife, but he's not really currently having a sexual relationship with his wife, because she's been sick for a little while, and he's just a little hard up, you know what I'm saying? But he meets this guy who claims that he can sell him a sex dream and he puts his hand on the guy's hand and rubs it and then says okay go to sleep and if you enjoy it come back and see me he goes to sleep and he does indeed have a pretty intense sex dream he wakes up he thinks oh that was actually kind of cool i really enjoyed that so he goes back to that guy buys more but he comes to find that these dreams come with a price of course now the movie's definitely interesting that's a really unique premise i've never seen anything like that before so it's an interesting plot the villain is an absolute monster he's so hateable so you're really rooting for him to go down in the end my main problem with the movie is just like it's just such an exploitation film that the sex dream scenes just go on way too long, and it feels way too much like you're just watching like a softcore adult film and not like a real movie. But other than that, Erotic Nightmare is pretty good, pretty interesting. But at number 18, I'm going to go with Superstition. This is a 1980s supernatural slasher film in which there's this house where a witch was executed on the grounds hundreds of years ago. And she is now haunting the place. She's killing teenagers that go in there. And this family moves in and the local priest is trying to help them with this haunting that's killing people. So it very much is like a traditional haunted house film, but very much merged with an 80s slasher. I'd seen this movie before, but it's my first time checking out on the Screen Factory Blu-ray. Uh, I watched it because I did a video on my top 10 80 slasher films that you might not have seen. Well, that was my part two video. And I like this movie. It just has... 
a second act that just really drags. So it starts with a bang. It ends with an even bigger bang. But it's slow going in the middle, partially because, like, I, I was really not into the characters in this movie, not really into the script. But the horror of it, the witch slasher horror, is pretty fantastic. At number 17... Here's a weird one. We've got Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday. So this Blu-ray can be found in my Friday the 13th box set, sitting right back there. I got that box set years ago, but I never rewatched Jason Goes to Hell I'd over, uh, on, the, on the box set. I'd only seen it once before years ago, and I'd never seen the unrated cut. And I've always heard the unrated cut makes this a much better movie. So a friend of mine was over one night, and we decided to throw in Jason Goes to Hell. It was his pick, and I was like, let's do this. It is such a wacky movie. <laughs> it is so bizarre. Just an insane direction to take a Friday the 13th movie where Jason is killed definitively at the beginning of the film in a pretty fantastic sequence. But now Jason is like haunting the world and he is transferring bodies, possessing different people to go to then go kill people further. Taking the Friday the 13th franchise in that direction is so ballsy, weird, and I respect it. The kill scenes in the unrated cut are incredible. Like, there's this one kill in a tent that is just one of the gnarliest things that the series has to offer by far. So I just enjoyed what a crazy movie it was. Is it a good movie? I mean, not really. It, 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 protagonists don't even show up in the movie until like over halfway through. So the movie's just kind of spinning its wheels watching Jason hop bodies for a long time. So crazy. But I definitely had a good time. My buddy and I really enjoyed rewatching Jason Goes to Hell. At number 16 is a movie I streamed and it's called The Third Saturday in October Part 4. Five, and I believe this came out last year, maybe the year before. And here's what this is. It's essentially a classic slasher nostalgia piece, but it's not trying to approximate just like an 80s slasher. It's trying to approximate a later sequel in a slasher franchise that came out in the 90s. So this is called Part 5, but it was the first movie in this series made. It opens saying that there was this cult classic called The Third Saturday in October back in the 70s, but now it's a lost film. But what we're going to watch is... Part 5, a direct-to-video sequel that came out in the 90s. Uh, of course, it's all fantasy, it's all fake, but they they made a sequel to a franchise that doesn't exist, and I think that's really interesting for indie filmmakers to do. The movie itself, I enjoyed because it's so odd. It, it's very low budget, it's got, you know, feels very regional in this small town, feels like they just got local people to act in it. It's just peppered with so many weird interactions, weird lines of dialogue, strange characters that I was consistently enjoying it. The kill scenes are actually pretty gnarly, the slasher killer they set up is pretty good, and apparently there is now a third Saturday in October part one. They made the movie that this is a sequel to. I haven't watched that, but I'm looking forward to it. So this is a weird watch. I checked out on Shudder. If you're interested in something like that, I think it's a pretty good version of it. Okay, at number 15, don't hate me, let me explain, is Don't Look Now on Criterion Blu-ray from 1973. Now, I have long considered this the biggest horror classic film that I had not seen. I picked it up in the last Criterion sale and finally gave it a watch this month. Okay, what the movie is about, what I knew about it going in was that it was starring Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie as parents, and at the beginning of the film, uh, they lose their daughter. Their young daughter drowns, passes away, and that's all I knew going in. So I didn't know what kind of horror subgenre we were going to be dealing with. But what surprised me about the movie is after that initial death scene, it cuts pretty far into the future. So we don't actually watch these characters go through that initial grief. We're now watching them after they've already gone through that. And it's a more subtle form of grief, grief that they're now dealing with. They're now living in Italy. And here, here's the thing with this movie. It has phenomenal performances. Julie Christie and Donald Sutherland are incredible in it. It has beautiful scenery in Italy. It is beautifully shot. It has such interesting editing. This, so many sequences are just so fascinatingly edited. I think, I gotta think this was pretty experimental from 1973. But the movie is so slow. It was really slow for me. But I, I, I was with it. I was sticking with it because I was like, I just know this is going to be building towards something incredible. And I, I had full faith in the movie. So I wasn't like bored. I wasn't restless. I knew we were building to something. And when we got to the end of the film, I was just not satisfied at all. I was not satisfied with the ending. It's kind of a, you know, a, a bit of a shocking image, an image I was not expecting to see. 
And I understand what the ending is going for on a metaphorical level. I understand the point it's trying to make. But on a narrative level, I found it so unsatisfying that the movie was not building towards that at all. And it just felt thrown at the wall to me. I looked at letterbox reviews. A lot of people say it's one of the most brilliant and terrifying horror film endings of all time. And it did not hit me that way at all. So I, I just found the movie slow and plotting and it, I didn't feel like it just led anywhere enough to justify that. So I did not love Don't Look Now. I, I have taken no pleasure in saying that. I know a lot of people love this film. Maybe on a rewatch, I'll get it more. Oh, one other thing I want to say, and I grabbed this other movie here to make the point. Um, this is another 70s horror film I watched recently on the Screen Factory 4K uh, last year, actually, a Haunting of Julia. I couldn't help but think watching Don't Look Now, I think The Haunting of Julia is the better version of it because it is uh, opens with a daughter dying. It follows the mother played by, um, oh gosh, uh, I'm blanking on her name. Terrible. Mia Farrow, of course, uh, played by Mia Farrow, watching her deal with this and then deal with a haunting from it. And I just think it does so much more with the premise and is just so much more interesting on a narrative level um, than Don't Look Now. So that's just me. That's my hot take, flaming hot take. And now uh, these my next picks are going to seem ridiculous in comparison that you're putting these above Don't Look Now. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't love Don't Look Now. But next up, I'm putting number one with a bullet, which is a canon action movie from the 1980s. Look, I put this on one night when I actually didn't feel like watching a horror movie. I know it doesn't happen very often these days, but I needed something else. I put in this Kino Lorber Blu-ray. And I thoroughly enjoyed this. It is a buddy cop action film uh, starring Robert Carradine and Billy D. Williams. Now, unfortunately, Billy D. Williams, yes, Lando Calrissian himself, love him. He's great in the movie. He's so charming. He's like this health freak, ladies man, cool cop. Um, but he he definitely takes a backseat. This is Robert Carradine's movie all the way. Robert Carradine is actually the super nerd from Revenge of the Nerds. So it's fascinating to see him playing a tough cop. And I didn't think I'd be able to buy him as a tough, badass cop. And I don't think I could. But I don't think that's what the movie's going for. I think he's more just kind of an unhinged weirdo cop. And I think he pulls that off very well. It's not very action-packed for sure. It's more so following Robert Carradine as he's like trying to nail this drug dealer, but he's also trying to get back with his wife. And um, the two actors had good camaraderie, I thought, and the action scenes were fun enough. And it was just a fun 80s canon movie. I like action movies from canon. They were a studio back in the 80s that made a lot of low budget films and I really enjoy them. So this is another one I enjoyed. At number 13, we've got Happy Birthday to Me from 1981. Yeah, this is a pretty big slasher classic that it took me a long time to finally check out, but I watched it in preparation for that slasher video that I mentioned that I made last month. I enjoyed the movie. I didn't like it quite as much as I wanted to. It's just under two hours, which is shockingly long for an 80s slasher. And I do wish this was tightened up. This should have been 90 minutes like every other 80s slasher film is. The structure of these movies is just much more fitting to that. But it's definitely well made. It's directed by a very competent director, Jay Lee Thompson, who's, who did a lot of cool stuff back in the day, like the 50s through the 80s. It's got a lot of really good death scenes as well. It's just a little light on a narrative level and I didn't love the characters and that that hurts the movie when it's this long but it's got a crazy ending so I definitely enjoyed that it's good it's a good slasher uh next up actually I got to bring this box set back uh, is the next movie that I watched and made in Hong Kong at number 12. That is The Demon's Baby. Now, The Demon's Baby came out in 1998, and it's a period piece. And for a long time, it's pretty much just like a romantic comedy. It's about these two servants who are working in the house of this general, this very rich general, who has four wives. The movie opens up with the wedding of him marrying his fourth wife. And uh, these two servants are just kind of falling in love, and, and there's some comedic stuff, and it's just just like a fun kind of good vibes movie. But then about halfway through, all four of this rich general's wives all get pregnant and we find out the babies are demon babies. They're possessed and it's just so crazy. The women's stomachs open up. You see the babies inside them. They have these like intestine tentacles that come out and grab people and pull them in to eat them. It's a crazy, crazy 90s Hong Kong horror film. I think it's a category three film, if I'm not mistaken. And I just enjoyed it because it was bonkers but it, it also had characters that I liked. 
And there's an essay in the booklet about this movie from Erica Schultz, who uh, who I know. I've done a lot of podcasts with. She does the Unsung Horrors podcast. She's really good. At number 11, we've got the Fright Night remake from 2011. So quick story about this movie. This is actually the first Fright Night film I ever saw. I saw it before I ever saw the original. And my reaction to it was, oh, that was pretty good. Like, I enjoyed it. That was good. And then later I saw the original Fright Night and I was like, oh, that's how it's done. Like, that's what Fright Night is supposed to be. So I never went back to this remake and I just watched the original over and over again ever since. But I finally picked up the Blu-ray and decided to give it a rewatch this month. And it is pretty good. Like, it does not hold a candle to the original Fright Night. Nothing in this movie is as good as it is in the original. But it's a good version of it. I think it does several updates that are smart. I like that it takes place in Vegas, so there's a reason for our vampire to be up all night, sleep all day, like a lot of people in Vegas are, and people come and go, so it's easy to kill people. Anton Yelchin plays Charlie. He's actually great, the best thing in the movie. Rest in peace to Anton Yelchin, gone far too soon, but he's a great Charlie. And Colin Farrell is a pretty good Jerry Dandridge. Now, they go a different direction with his character. They very much go like an alpha male, beer drinking, white tank top direction with him, which is definitely different than Chris Sarandon did, but it's a pretty good version of this vampire character. And I think where the movie really shines is in action scenes. Yes, it's a horror film, but there are certain action sequences of fighting vampires, particularly a car chase, actually. And they're really strong, really good. And also quite like David Tennant as Peter Vincent. He kind of does like a Russell Brand meets Jack Sparrow meets Keith Richards kind of a weirdo thing, but uh, does a really good job. N nothing like Roddy McDowell. The heart isn't there like Roddy McDowell, but pretty good. So I like the Fright Night remake. I do think it's pretty darn good. At number 10, we've got Edge of the Axe. This is a 1980 slasher film that I put very high on my slasher list that I put out last month. This is a Spanish film, actually, but uses a lot of American actors, so you can barely tell. It takes place in a small town in which these two teenagers are kind of falling in love, and they're a couple of computer geeks, so it's fun to see the 1980s version of all this computer stuff, computer games and texting even, instant messaging, I guess you'd say. All that's pretty fun, but there's all these murders going on, and where I think the movie really shines is a great looking slasher killer. I love his mask, his axe. He, he just has a phenomenal look and great kill scenes. The reveal at the end of the movie definitely doesn't totally makes sense. I don't think it totally works by any means, but this is just fun. This is just a good vibes 80s slasher, and uh, this is a very cool Arrow Video Blu-ray. At number nine, we've got another streaming watch. This is Stop Motion from this year. This film actually just came out. I rented it digitally and was able to watch it that way, and the film is about a woman who is a stop motion animator, but she is the daughter of an even more successful, much more successful, legendary stop motion animator. So she's trying to get out of that shadow, make her own thing. And she starts making this very horrific stop motion film, uh, starting these frightening creations that she makes herself. And she starts going to darker and more extreme methods to get the materials to make these frightening creations. Where the movie really shines is in the stop motion sequences. They're super creepy, very disturbing stuff, which I really like that. And the movie has a sequence of gore that I felt like almost gave me a heart attack. Just a horrifying <laughs> gore sequence that's, you know, not too over the top because the more over the top gore, of course, is less disturbing because you're more aware that it's fake. This is something that you can, your brain can wrap your head around, even though you don't want to. So I thought that was very impressive. The movie felt a little bit same old, same old in terms of being a movie about a woman losing her mind. I feel like we've gotten a lot of movies like that lately and it hits a lot of those familiar beats. And the ending was like fine, but didn't pack the punch I wanted it to. But stop motion is definitely a good new release horror film. It actually just hit Shudder, so you can stream it right now, and it'll be hitting Blu-ray middle of this month. At number eight, we've got another new horror film that I streamed, another one that I rented. This is called Frogman. This is a found footage horror film about a guy who, when he was a kid and on vacation with his family, just kind of filming vacation stuff, he caught a glimpse of a frogman, a humanoid man-sized frog that is living out in the woods. And apparently this is a real cryptid, you know, like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. This is a real legend that surrounds this one town. And uh, the movie is about that town and we cut to him being an adult and he gets his camera out and he decides to make a documentary film proving once and for all that Frogman does exist. I loved this movie. Like, I really did. I thought it was a great found footage film. 
the characters were definitely good enough to get on their side. And when we just go through those usual found footage shenanigans that found footage films always have, I was kind of happy with it because I liked the characters. I thought the actors were pretty strong. And once we get into the second half or the third act, when the Frogman stuff is really hitting the fan, I kind of felt like it was going to go some kind of cliche ways, but I didn't think it did. And I thought it really delivered on being a cryptid horror film about a legendary monster out in the woods, this Frogman. It delivers. It's got great monster practical effects, creature suits, and uh, some pretty shocking things towards the end. And I loved this. I don't watch a lot of found footage, but sometimes when I do, I just get really invested in it because the format just really brings you into the reality of the situation. And I just got really invested in this movie and I just enjoyed it as a monster film. Frogman is a big recommend for me. I hadn't seen it when I made my top 10 horror films of the year so far list last month, um, but it would be quite high on the list now that I've seen it. So let's go on to number seven, which is Asylum. This is a amicus anthology horror film from the 1970s, 1973. Amicus is a production company that made a lot of anthology horror films around this time. I'm actually doing a review series on these movies. So I did review Asylum last month. My second time watching the movie, but my first time on this Severin Blu-ray. I really enjoy this movie. It's actually only got like three segments and then one segment at the end that kind of ties into the wraparound, but they're mostly all pretty strong with one exception. And uh, the wraparound in which this guy is coming into this asylum to be a new doctor and he's being told the stories of all the different inmates there. It's a really good structure for a horror anthology film. And of course you got Peter Cushing in here, legendary Peter Cushing in the best, probably the best segment of the movie. So so Asylum is definitely a good time and you can check out my review for it on the channel right now. Let's go into number six, which is Odds Against Tomorrow. This is another non-horror film. This is actually a 1950s black and white noir film starring Harry Belafonte and Robert Ryan. And what it is basically is it's a heist film, but most of the movie doesn't take place during the heist. It's leading up to it and watching the separate lives of the characters played by Harry Belafonte and Robert Ryan, watching their lives kind of fall apart in different ways and them getting pushed to the desperation of joining this heist, which they don't want to do. Like they're very, uh, if I remember right, they're pretty low level criminals, or I think Harry Belafonte is just like a gambling addict. So not even really a criminal, but they don't want to get involved in big crime, like robbing a bank, but they get pushed into it by circumstances and all that stuff's really interesting. And there's definitely very interesting racial politics, especially for 1959, because Robert Ryan is a pretty racist guy. And Harry Belafonte, of course, is a black man. And watching their conflict because between that is pretty interesting. Uh, my favorite thing about the movie is Harry Belafonte. I'm becoming such a fan of him as an actor, not just as a singer, but as an actor. I thought he was phenomenal, just like so charismatic in this film. And I'm a big fan of Robert Ryan as well. So this is a really good 50s noir film. An ending that it like is really on the nose, but you got to remember it's 1959. They got to hit certain points harder for that audience, particularly about racial politics, than really has to be hit now. But very, very good. So I really enjoyed watching this on this Kino Lorber Blu-ray. Moving on to number five, uh, we've got The Nest. This is a 1980s creature feature from 1987. So I'm actually planning a 80s creature feature list video that's going to be coming up this month and I'm very excited for. So I've got a couple of those movies here on the list now. And The Nest on the Screen Factory Blu-ray, I watched it. I was so impressed with it. Honestly, I wasn't expecting too much. What it is, it's very much like a Jaws ripoff, but instead of a shark, it's an infestation of cockroaches. And it's about this small town sheriff on this coastal small town. And they just get infested by all these cockroaches. They bring in like an expert to try to deal with it. And the sheriff's trying to deal with it. And all the while, there's actually this um, love triangle going on where like his first love comes back into town who left to go live in the big city, but now she's back and he has to choose between her and his new girlfriend. And I actually like that stuff. I like these characters. The actors were really good. And the cockroach horror is pretty gross and goes wild by the end of it. There is stuff I was not expecting out of a cockroach horror movie that I was super happy with. Crazy 80s practical effects goodness. So The Nest is really fun. And it's just got that small town atmosphere I enjoy with some gross 80s practical effects. What more could you want? At number four, another 80s creature feature. This is The Kindred. And this is a movie that I saw a long time ago. Just like found a web random website where I could stream it because this was really hard to find for a while. But a little while back, Synapse put out a really 
expensive steelbook release of it. I held off on that. They just released this standard edition and I got it on Amazon for $17. This is a movie about a, uh, a young doctor whose mother just passes away, but as she's dying, she tells him about his brother, Anthony. And he goes back to his mother's house to, you know, settle her affairs but also to investigate who is Anthony. And basically, he finds out that there were some experiments done, and his brother is a test tube baby that used his DNA. And because of that, th that just takes us on a wild creature feature journey that is so nuts. He's at his mother's old house with a bunch of his colleagues, just like, you know, a bunch of attractive, like, early 30-somethings, late 20-somethings that are there to get attacked by this absolute horrific monster and the movie just has so many cool practical effects it is an 80s practical effects showcase film in the best way i think it's so much fun you know on a story and character level it's like good enough definitely good enough to get you through just creature feature goodness so the kindred is a fantastic time just really enjoy it so at number two and three are I would say at this point, my two favorite horror movies of this year so far, and it's really hard for me to pick between the two, especially since one of them I just saw, but at least for now, at number three, I'm going to put In a Violent Nature. This is a brand new release. It just hit theaters, and it is a slasher film, a typical backwoods camper slasher film where the hook is you follow the killer for almost the whole movie. We begin the film with the grave of Johnny being disturbed and him rising back from the dead, a vengeful spirit coming out of the ground. And we follow him as he walks through the woods, comes across different people, and tries to get the item that was stolen from his grave back. Now, going into this movie, I was definitely nervous that it would be boring. I thought, are we just going to watch a guy walk through the woods for a long time? And some people are saying that's exactly what this movie is. But I just don't agree with that because I had a great time watching this movie. Because, yes, while he's walking through the woods, I just thought there's, there's always something going on. It's never aimless walking. He's always walking towards something or he's eavesdropping on conversations. So there's dialogue scenes or he's coming across different things like... The movie keeps it fresh, so I was definitely never bored. It's constantly introducing different things, different kinds of kill scenes. The kill scenes are very well peppered throughout the film to really keep the pacing, and the kill scenes are great. I thought this was just a, such a great deconstruction of the slasher genre. A typical slasher film played from a different perspective, just played in just enough of a different way to be really fresh and unique. This slasher character is great. The kills are great. I kind of loved this movie and I just put out a review for it. So if you missed that, you can check that out on the channel right now. But at number two, I'm going to say my favorite horror film of the year is still Immaculate, starring Sydney Sweeney as a nun who finds that she is pregnant, even though she's never been with a man. So she's treated as the second coming of the Mother Mary. The priests and the nuns around her declare it's an immaculate conception. It's something from God. And the movie is a mystery of her figuring out what is actually inside of me? What is actually going on? And I actually thought the movie worked as a mystery because I couldn't quite tell where it was going. And it wasn't exactly the typical Rosemary's Baby thing that I was expecting. It's got a fresh spin, something that is weird and wacky, possibly offensive, but I respected it. I really, really did. Look, when it comes to new horror films, I often just, I favor the weird and wacky stuff. You know, like... I acknowledge The First Omen is a similar movie this year. This is definitely the classier, more prestige version that plays it much more straight. But Immaculate is the weird and wacky outlandish one. And that's just where my taste kind of lies with modern horror. Like, I loved Cobweb. I loved Malignant. And this isn't as crazy as those, but it gets kind of close. So I, I loved Immaculate. I think it's great. But at number one is a classic movie I finally saw for the first time. This is Southern Comfort from 1981, directed by Walter Hill. Now, this recently got a really nice 4K edition from Vinegar Syndrome as part of their VSU line, their most prestige just beautiful packaged releases. And I was definitely interested in the movie because of that, but I actually have kind of a love-hate relationship with Walter Hill. I don't love Walter Hill as much as a lot of other film fans do. He's got several movies that have disappointed me. So I knew I had to check this one out first before I bought a nice Vinegar Syndrome edition of it. I watched it on Amazon Prime streaming, and this is now my favorite Walter Hill movie I've seen. I love this. It's about a squad from the Louisiana National Guard who is going out into the woods to do a training exercise. So they 
got a bunch of guns full of blanks. They're just going out to do some training and they end up getting lost. They find a couple of canoes and they need to cross a river. So they're like, we'll just take these canoes. You know, it won't be that big a deal. They sail across, but the owners of the canoes catch them. And one of them is a joke, which is so insane, fires his gun of blanks at the guy. Just like, ha ha, it's just a fake gun anyway, who cares? But those guys don't know the gun is fake and they get their gun out and they shoot one of them dead. And now the rest of the movie is this squad of guys trying to find their way out of the woods while being hunted by a group of Louisiana Cajuns who are on their tail and want to kill them all for revenge. It is such an awesome movie. Such a great cast of so many good tough guy character actors like Powers Booth and Fred Ward and Keith Carradine, who's one of the Carradines I'm definitely less familiar with, but I thought he was great in this movie movie as the I don't give a damn kind of attitude guy of the squad. It's just such a great survivalist movie watching these guys try to make it out. But what also makes it interesting is they're very morally ambiguous and some of them are actually straight up bad guys. And you understand why the local people there want to kill them, why they felt that threat from them. So it's just such a good game of cat and mouse. And by the end, it's something really interesting that almost takes it in a bit of a folk horror kind of direction. This is definitely an action thriller that has its hint of horror for sure. So I thought Southern Comfort is a great movie. It's my favorite Walter Hill movie by far. And I'm absolutely going to pick up that Vinegar Syndrome release. I really, really want that. So that's my watch list, but I want to know yours. Let me know down in the comments below. What did you watch last month? What were some of your favorites? Please let me know. I would love to hear about it. If you want to watch another one of my monthly watch list videos, check out this playlist right down here. All of them are there. I've been doing this every month for well over a year. Give a like if you enjoyed this and a subscribe for more videos like this. Thank you for watching. I will see you next time.